All right, welcome to uh, the podcast, Tom. Thank you for your time, mate. Cheers, pal. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we've got Tom Webb here at Woodbury House, uh, being filmed by Mimboso. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get you down and, and talk to you You've because been to do it for a while, haven't I you? know. So, like my podcast, as I was saying earlier, um, Stephen Sully study. What that means is my my take on success, my ongoing journey of looking at successful people, and that could be from all walks of life. So, Tom, I know you as a friend now. Got to know you over the last 12, 18 months really well. We've obviously done an art show together, which yeah. we're going to talk about. So you're an artist? Yeah. Magician? Yeah. Brilliant dancer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pub public speaker? Yes, yeah. So for there's going to be a big audience that does know you. Yeah. But then sure. there's other people that kind of know you, but need to know a little bit more. So yeah. uh, what was your like start, you know, Let's take it, it all yeah, the way back. Yeah. What's your, what's your, the grassroots of Tom Webb? The grassroots, I guess, hmm, that's a tough one. I mean, hmm, I think it started, it really started when I was like 13. It started before that, you know, I always had this massive love for computers and technology. You know, uh, my dad was a like, very famous programmer. He made a video game in the 80s called Outrun that was like the biggest game ever. Back in the 80s, like video games, it was like one a year that was sick. So I had this like legacy, so to speak, of, of being surrounded by computers. Like built my first computer when I was like 10 or something. Right. Really into that. And at school, I was like super into that. And I got, I got heavily into uh, making animations. So I used to try and make like stick man animations when I was like 13. Right. That, that was like the first thing I was addicted to. And I remember being in the computer room and it was so funny. The kids, the kids, the, like the older kids, they had this like crew, they made these like prank videos. Mm -hmm. Like this is before, this is when YouTube was like just coming out. They made these prank videos and I think they started it, but they dissed me in their video. Cause I was making these stick man videos and showing everyone at school, like these stick animations. And they dissed me in their video. So I then made a music video dissing them <laughs> with the stick man. So I made all the animations, they all get like, they all, but I don't know, it was, it was stupid. Right. And then there was this beef. So it kind of like, I started doing that. And then I, I kind of, uh, I think it was like 17. I was working, it's 16, I was 16. I was working at Starbucks, my first ever job. And you know, like uh, one of the baristas there, the coffee guys, he, he did this magic trick. And I'm like, he did this simple thing, made a car disappear. And when I saw it, I was like, holy, like, oh my, I need to know how to do this. I need to know how, to, how this works. So he, he taught me, I remember trading with him. I was like, okay, look, I'll do it. Uh, I'll uh, clean the toilets for a month. Cause right. like, that's the worst thing in Starbucks, having to clean the toilets. Yeah. No one wants that job. So I was like, I'll do that. I'll do make, you know, every closing shift, I'll clean the toilets, but you have to show me how it's done. So he shows me how it's done. And then the next day I'm like, all right, give me more. <laughs> and he tells me how to like, where to go buy a magic book. And then I spent the next year I actually, to be honest, I spent the next three months, every single night I worked at this golf range. It was hilarious, five pounds an hour. I'd work for four hours and I'd go there like, <laughs> for 20 quid. Right. And I, you know, sometimes have to go out on the range. It was a very old golf club. So I'd go out on the driving range and people would be hitting balls and I'd have to go and pick balls up by hand. So they had right. balls to play with, like it was hilarious. Um, I'd work there and what I'd do in the, in the meantime is I would practice card tricks. I'd sit there and I'd have a video up and I would just practice. And I mean like just for four hours straight every night for months. One day some guy comes in and I used to do this thing. I'd be like, hey, do you want to see some magic? So this guy is like French dude. He's like, I was like, do you want to see some magic? And how old was you at this point? I'm 17 now. 17. Yeah, I'm right. about, I've just turned 17. And um, I remember because, yeah. I ten, just turned, 10 years ago. Two ten days years, two days ago. Two days ago. Ten, it's been 10 years. Yeah. Wow, it's been 10 years. It feels like it's been a lot longer than 10 years. Um, the guy's like, yeah, okay. I show him this trick and he's like, oh, I have a restaurant. Come and perform at the restaurant. I'm like, hell yeah. Sick. Hell yeah. So he's, I call him up and he's like, how much do you want? I'm like, oh, 40 quid? <laughs> like for three hours? Yeah. You know, I was just thinking of how much I get paid already. He's like, done. So me and my family, I remember I drive the car because I got my provisional. We drive to the restaurant, I do the show. And I remember it was so funny, the first table I, I went to was my, my parents, my family, and they all hyped me up. Like my dad's like, my dad lives overseas and he's come over and he's like hyping me up. I'm like, okay, I feel great. The first table I go to that are punters, give the pack of cards to this woman and she drops them all over the floor. And in that moment, I'm just like, this is, 
this is everyone's nightmare. Like the cards are all <laughs> in a special order. <clears throat> you know, it costs like 50 quid, like this one pack. And because I had a lot of tricks and a lot of them were like, you know, we call them packet tricks, things that you have like, you know, a pack of cards in a special order and you tell a story with them. Uh-huh. So I'm like, oh, can we swear on this? We can't, can we? Of course we can. Oh, fuck. I was but like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> fuck yeah. Of course we like, can. I was like, <laughs> fuck. Like, shit, this is the worst. Picking the cards up, everyone's laughing. I'm like, oh, my career's over. So anyway, I keep hustling it. And at the end of the night, the guy comes up to me and he's like, that was great. He hands me 60 quid. I'm like, fuck, 60 quid. Decent. And the first thing I thought was, the, the tricks I'm going to be able to buy with this. Like, uh, it's going to be sick. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from this guy, this French dude's like, hey, hey mate, hey, my name's Etienne. Um, I heard you did magic at my restaurant. I'm like, what do you mean? So there's this magician and his resident, resident uh, place is a show every Tuesday. He's at this restaurant. Little did I know this guy, Etienne, world champion of magic. World motherfucking champ. He did the royal wedding for like William K. Like the guy is mm. next level shit. So I meet him, I show him a few of, I've been doing magic for four months. Like there are kids my age doing craziest shit. Met him, he's like, all right, I'm gonna sign you as my number two, I'm gonna train you up. And for the next- Incredible. Yeah, for the next six years, seven years, I, I, mean, I would fucking go to Guernsey on the plane for a hundred quid and do magic for like Gok Wan at some weird event. Like I was, and he was probably making money out of me, but it didn't matter because I was, I was learning, I was getting, getting experience. experience. Yeah, I was grafting hard. I remember driving like five hours to fucking Wales to do a wedding for like a couple hundred quid. And yeah, really hustling it. So I did that for like six years. And then and then the internet stuff came back and I remember being at uni, I did I did finance. I'm giving you quite the long story. No, right? I want to hear it. Yeah, right, it's right. really, really important that okay. people know the nuts and bolts of yeah, it all. Yeah, the hustle, like you, yeah. you gotta know about the hustle. Like, So went to uni, did finance, hated it. And when I was at uni, I was like, oh, I've got an idea. Like, I want to be number one on Google. If I'm number one on Google, I'm going to get all of the inquiries for magicians. Yeah. So like people, I researched this, spent so much time learning about SEO. This is back when SEO was just like, just come out. And uh, I was like, if I'm number one for magician in London, how, how am I going to do that? And I realized that if I, if I had London in my domain name, that I'm going to rank well, number one. So I, I changed my name to TomLondonMagician.com. I have got to admit, yeah. I had you as Tom London in my phone up yeah. until two weeks ago. Yeah, of course ago. you did. Everyone does. Like, yeah. Cause you know what? Because you know, I kept on forgetting you was under Tom London. I'm digressing here, but I was like, I can't, I can't find Happened Tom. last and, night. Yeah. Someone was um, tagging me on a video and he's like, they're like, well, what's your Instagram? It's changed. And they've written yeah. Tom London. I'm yeah. like, I'm not. That's, my... that's clever for the SEOs Mate, and stuff. It was business move. It was purely business. It was like, Tom London, you're going to remember that. Sounds a bit... Sounds a bit fun. Uh, fine enough, my name before that, you're gonna laugh at this. No one really knows this. Uh, I think it's the first time I've said this in, in forever. My first name was The Naked Magician. Okay. I was trying to do the Jamie Oliver thing. <laughs> 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 and I, I had the nakedmagician.com and I had business cards. And then I realized at 16, 17, I remember getting a call and someone asked like, are you gonna do Magic Topless? And I'm like, oh no, this is the wrong brand. Yeah. This is not good. Nah. But you make those mistakes, right? Like, yeah. You, you know, you make those But mistakes. you had a lot of inquiries though, didn't you? I did actually, yeah. Right. I had one guy being like, hey, I wanna manage you. Like you do Magic Nate. I'm like, oh God, this is not what I'm, this Probably is not what I, yeah. Wrong this demographic. Not, this is not what I'm really <laughs> trying to be. Um, but it's, that's the thing, it's the learning curve. And what was really actually funny <clears> enough <throat> during that whole process. So it started off with SEO, I started making some good money. You know, you're getting paid, you know, so good. Like, magicians get paid well. You could get, uh, back in the day, I remember getting like, you get four or 500 for a couple of hours. Yeah. Which is great cash to like, you know, turn, turn up and get paid that. It's brilliant. Um, start becoming rank one on, on Google. My web design stuff, I'm you know, a programmer. Started having a good website. And I realized back then, like, none of the magicians had good websites. So I, I just made a really good website. Okay. Just a banging website. And then I was like, all right, cool how do I become like elite? And I realized I had to look the part. And then I was like, right, I watched um, also Batang's documentary on tailoring. You know, I was like studying tailoring. I mean, studying it to the point where I was, a, I was gonna go become a tailor. I was like, how do I, how do I look and you know, dress? So it's like, I look like someone that belongs at the table. Yeah. I remember going to Savile Row and, and, and being in there and just like, I would get my suits cut. It was, it was crazy, I put so much time into it. I'd be like, I want, I want it taken in the waist here, the shoulders like that. It was exactly how I saw it based on all of the study. And it took me a while to get right. 
But then it got to a point, I remember going to this, um, I did a gig at the Mayfair and I, pick, uh, I picked up my suit. Mayfair from, Hotel. Yeah, from William Hunt was my tailor, right? I love yeah. their suits. Yeah, they're brilliant. Beautiful. And it was like, and they're a great entry, like Savile Row, right? Yeah, yeah. So I remember like, I picking up this new suit I had from there and I put it on and I just like, I was like, holy shit, this thing is fucking fire. It's like gray, Prince of Wales, check, with white, like white shirt and a collar bar. And I walked into this place and it was, it was the event, it was for the super yachts billion uh, like super super yachts like over 150 mil all of the clientele christmas party so i walk in there everyone's a billionaire i walk in there and i had like six people be like where's that suit from that's an incredible suit they thought i owned a yacht so wow. i thought i owned a fucking yacht so i'm doing magic for them image is everything dude it, in that world yeah 100 percent. yeah it clicked these people think i'm one of them and then I do some magic for them and we get on, you know, you're a friendly person, you have shared interests, you know, you share, int like watches, if you know about watches and you see somebody's into watches. It's rapport. It's rapport, exactly. Before I know it, these guys are like, why don't you come to mine and do a party? And then it's like, now you're getting paid serious cash. Like now you're seeing another side to it. So then it, then it kind of got a bit crazy. I remember like, I'd get flown out to Cannes, <clears throat> helicoptered into someone's yacht, and then transferred to their other yacht. It'd be like 150 meters, like stupid. Like do a private show for someone, and they'll be the cra they'll be they'll be the craziest people who own companies like Apple, like those kind of people. Yeah, and you start moving in those circles. People start knowing your name. So I was doing that, and, and it was it's very much a business. It's purely business. Yeah, like I didn't really love doing magic. It was a great business. I was good at it. And then I got the call to do America's Got Talent. And I was like, okay. I was gonna come on to this bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's fascinating is that before that happened though, before that happened at 22, I remember finishing uni, like three months before I moved into London, like can I afford it? Cause London's expensive, man. Mm. Like my first place, the rent was like 1600 and I was sharing it with a friend. But like fresh out of uni, that's like, oh God, where am I gonna? So yeah, much. it's scary, it's scary for sure. Like I'm from like a small little town in Kent where like, you know, 800 a month gets you a house. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like a yeah. full blown house with a garden. And a, so I was like, got this little cupboard for in Elephant Castle. And I still know like living that close on it was it was it was great. I was lucky that I could do that. Yeah. Um, I uh, before that happened, I had three months living at home and I was like, right, I'm going to teach myself to program well. So I sat down and I entered a competition to make a video game in 48 hours. And I did it, it was like 200 people entered it, I made a video game, I came third. I'm like, holy shit, this That's is incredible. Yeah, I was like, this is I'm definitely this is something I should be doing. So I spent the next two years making this video game, which was a racing game, and it got greenlit on Steam, which for back then was like a big deal. It was like Steam's like the biggest platform for buying games. I spent two years building it. I had publishers wanting to invest in it. It was going really, really well. Never finished it. But then I could program, and I could program apps. So then I started making these apps on the iPads, and I would do magic with an iPad. <clears throat> So I'd have an iPad and have an image on it and I'd animate it, program it, and I could grab things out of the iPad, put them back in, iPad magician. And there's this other guy, this German dude who did that, went viral, everyone wanted an iPad magician. So now I'm flying to like America every fucking week, going and doing shows and like for, I was doing, I'm doing shows for This Apple. is before America's Got Talent. Yeah, and I'm doing iPad magic and wow. it's like, this is like technology's enabled that. And then I get the call from America's Got Talent and they're like, what have you got? And, and when like, you say you got a call from them, who called you? Just one of the agents? Um, my manager at the time got a call from there from because they have like sometimes they have scouts who try and find like and um, yeah uh, they're like hey like we've seen your stuff do you want to come audition yeah because right. it's, it's, it's odd it's odd in a way mm. in some ways it's fantastic but mm. also odd because I would initially think that why not Britain's got talent why America yeah. it, Very, was it just timing no 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 I, I wouldn't I got offered to do Britain I did Britain's got talent when I was 21 I broke my hand in an American football game and then three days later to try to do this audition. I was like trying to do card tricks with a broken. It was stupid. It was all wrapped up. I didn't get through. Didn't get through. Cheesy yeah. as fuck. I remember wearing this Hugo Boss suit and I did the whole thing to James Bond's theme song. Right. It was so bad. <laughs> but like you have to fail to, to learn. Of course it. you do, sir. So I realized that was a terrible thing to be doing. Anyway, I remember waiting in the queue. Oh, it was so bad. Um, Britain's Got Talent is like, you know, two, two three rounds. Viewership isn't that great. It's a bit of a joke. You know, you watch Britain's Got Talent and the people that go on it, it's usually kind of like, they're making fun of people. You know, it's, it's America's Got Talent, another league. Like five rounds, most viewed thing in America in the summer. Mm. The episode I was, I was on, like broke viewership records. Yeah. Like broke summertime viewership records. It's just like unheard of. You know, 20 million people see this thing. 
and it went out online and got 40 million views in a few days. You just you just don't get that exposure from anywhere yeah, other yeah. than something like that. And anyway, so I got that and I was like, okay, here's, here, oh, mate, it was so funny. I was like, um, I've been doing this thing. I built this program where I could control everyone's phones. So I worked out a way to be able to control the screen of everyone's mobile phone without them having to be on a Wi-Fi network. So they could be connected to their own 3G. Jesus. Yeah. And, and that's scary at the same time. No, it's not actually that scary. It's quite, it's pretty straightforward. I basically get people to go on this website. And when they go on the website, the screen then basically becomes my television. Right. And I built a program that just allowed me to show whatever I wanted on it. Okay. So now I've got this like powerful program and I said it, said it to them and they, you know, did auditioned it and they loved it. Um, but that was like, that was, that was when it was like, okay, here we go. Like, Technology is so powerful, but not in the way where it's like, oh, I've built an app and I'm going to get, you know, 10 million investment and start a business. Technology in the in the, in the sense where it's like, actually, 99% of people don't really know a lot about technology, mm -hmm. and if you can show them in a way that's fun, mm -hmm. it's 10 times more impressive than going like, there's a floating car. Yeah. If, if I showed you a floating car right now, you'd probably just be like, oh, cool. Like you just expect it. Yeah. But if you can make the story about it more compelling, you know, if you can really communicate why it's so cool, the technology that's working within, etc. Right. I think, or just change the way that the applications work. I think then it's like instead of a floating car, same technology could be a floating table. I mean, if I had a floating coffee table, I think that's ten times more impressive than float. I don't know. Like if that was floating right now, I'd be like, wait a second. Do you mean that's just like hovering? Like, yeah. I don't know. That might capture your like imagination more. But that's when I realized that. And then, and then I did that, loads of hype. And that was when things really got really bizarre, you know, because I had this like real choice. I was getting- How far did you get into it? I got through, I got through the first round and I didn't get through the second one. Um, and like I did my TED talk on, on that about why yeah. I'm not getting through and, and what I thought about all of that. Because just as it, sorry to yeah. interject, but like, Fucking like going to America's Got Talent. Whereabouts in America was it? Uh, LA. It was LA. So you're in a massive state. You're obviously got a massive audience, massive show. Yeah. You're obviously performing high intensity tricks. And when I say that, you've got a big audience, so therefore it becomes quite a bit of pressure. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. But then yeah. you're holding yourself in such a way where I don't know when you're talking. It's like you're, it's like you were meant to be there. It was like you were so like. Oh, but this is the thing. Your communication yeah. was so effective. Yeah, but people don't realise. Like I spent three months in front of a mirror every day, saying different things, trying to work out like what is the narrative of this thing. Yeah, it's not something you just get up and just do. It's like you really like you know. We're going to get onto this in a second when we talk about the keynote speaking because I think my approach to keynote speaking is is pretty pretty funny. But then a lot of them, a lot of people do speak like that, but. Yeah, I get up in front, sometimes I just go outside, I walk around in circles and just talk to myself. Because you've got to hear it, you've got to hear like the pace of it, like how is it going to sound, how is it going to tra how's it going to communicate? Yeah, it's to like people? role play. 100%, you yeah. just put yourself in that. In we, that. We, we get salespeople do it all the time. This, this is the thing, isn't it? It's like you, you learn by doing. Um, but what was funny about all that was like the tricks, like they, they, they went wrong every time I performed them in practice. And then I went on stage and Executed them. Yeah, and I may, I'm not lying. I was absolutely bricking it. Like I was, I, I've never been so scared in my whole life. Because it's like the biggest. It's the biggest. You would, imagine if it went wrong. Yeah. You would never let yourself. And it did. In the second one, it went wrong for me. Did it? Yeah. It, 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 it didn't go wrong for me. Actually, the sound guys didn't have the sound turned on. So I kind of got a bit fucked in a way. And and it wasn't as effective as it should have been because. The second one was mad. I mean, you've seen it, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's, it was just, I think what I did there was just mad. I still, to this day, I think it's mad. And that's like what my TED talk was about because that's the problem, isn't it? You do, you do crazy stuff like that and you get let down. That's, I guess, why I don't work in a team. So, <laughs> so like uh, yesterday, yeah. thankfully, I had an opportunity to go train, spa, and then do a podcast with a athlete, ex-athlete called Robbie I Lloyd Taylor. I saw the Instagram post. Your sparring is impeccable. <laughs> Thank you. Can't wait to get uh, ready. But I've got, as I said, <laughs> as I said to you, at any moment, if you wanted to end my life, he could have. I could have. He, yeah. yeah, easy. But anyway, he shared a story, and basically, he was a pro boxer. Yeah. Something like halfway through his career, <clears throat> and there's a competition which still goes on today in, in match room, which Eddie Hearn runs okay. on Sky Sports. Yep called, uh, what's it called, what's it called, I forgot now. Anyway, it's like a competition. And he wasn't nominated for it, but it was a reserve. And anyway, this competition, it's called Prize Fire. Okay. So this competition, Great you title. might have three or four 
uh, different fights in a night. And yeah. if you win a tournament, it yeah. gives you recognition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They obviously give you a cash bonus at the end. Yeah. They leapfrog you into like a title fight, whether it's nationally or maybe European fight. Yeah. Basically, it validates makes, yeah, you as a you boxer. Yeah, and it's high intensity on that night. Yeah. So anyway, he was 95% not gonna fight, but he said to me, the law of attraction he, he always believed in, and he said to himself, as he was approaching the stadium, he thought, you know what, I feel I'm gonna fight tonight. They handed him four tickets, so he was gonna be in the crowds. His sister was there. Oh, he was reserved, isn't he? Yeah, yeah of course. So anyway, about 10 minutes before the actual tournament started, one of the boxers in the changing room has fainted. Eddie Hearn's come over to him and said, look, it's between you and someone else. Yeah. If you want to take it, the opportunity is there. Yeah. And basically, you'll need to be on in the next five minutes without yeah, yeah. any warm-up. You, yeah, just, yeah. Gotta, you, just, gotta, you just got to glove you up, basically. Yeah, to the opportunity, 100%. So basically, he was sitting there and thinking, should I take this or not? Yeah. He obviously stood up, yeah. went ahead with it, took his opportunity, and he was 25 to one, not not gonna win. So yeah. if everything was against him, yeah. he ended up winning the fucking tournament. He won it. So what, the reason why I think this is relevant to you he is because, won it. exactly. Wow. So you've got such a uh, platform. Mm. So now you're on America's Got Talent. Okay, granted you didn't win it, but let's yeah. just say you've got viewed by so many people. Yeah, this is what's people, cool. People's got to know you. This is what's cool. Consequently, and I don't know if this is true, but yeah. your Instagram following, which in today's world is important, yeah. has bloomed up. So How many followers you got on that? Uh, f- ah, 40, 40, 50, 40, 40 yeah. yeah, yeah. But what's, what was cool was about that was that at the time, like I've done all the SEO, like I'm a computer kid. When the show came through, no one got any social media like I was getting. For, like, okay, the, the, the guys, like the ones who won it, yeah, of course they blew up. Like, and the people who were already big, yeah. But in terms of just people randomly, like I, I had this cult following. And then when I didn't get, when I didn't get through, it was trending on Twitter, like bring back Tom London. Like I was just slaying, I was like, this is my shot. I'm gonna be the social media. I remember having thousands of DMs a day mm. and I was just like, right, I'm gonna apply to all of them. Like engage, 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 engage. This yeah. is my time. And then at the time, it was really cool. A friend of mine, he was like, oh, I know someone on Instagram. And I hit them up like, hey, can I get verified? And a few days later, I get the verified thing. And I'm like, that's when, that's when things, like the verified thing is really- The blue tick. Yeah, it's a powerful tool for business. Like, I'm at, and I've been, very, I've been very smart about how I use that because what it allows you to do is get instant recognition when you want to approach, like cold call. You validate, right? Validate. Exactly. Like if you want to approach someone and do something, if you've got a tick, it's a little bit different to if you're just random. Like you're no longer because everyone gets hit. I get hit up on Instagram all the time. People want to do something, mm. and you're kind of like, are you serious? Are you not serious? This is so when you see someone with a blue tick, there's a, there's a little bit of like, okay, right. Well, it's your CV basically. Yeah. And you now will, it's, now it's yeah. changed though. Now it's now it's got even better because now you see like three or four people that you follow that follow that person. Yeah. So now it's like, where well, you're followed by X, Y, Z. Yeah. Now you must be of interest to those people, therefore you must, you're validated by them. You yeah. get what I'm saying? Of course. But, but at the time, that, that, was, that was the way I was working. So yeah, so I, I had this platform, getting all of this stuff, and then in January, I'm like, you know what, this is really deep. Because <laughs> I, had, I had management behind me, I'm in and out of meetings to, to make a TV series, I'm pitching TV shows. I'm actually like pitching TV shows. And they're like, we like it, we're interested. Mm. And it sounds crazy when I say it, but at the time I was just like, well, do I really want to be doing magic forever? You know, I went to, in January I went to Doha and I did the ATP World Tennis Final, right? And I performed for the like, Royal Family and all the tennis players, um, like Dominic, Dominic TM, like all that lot, you know? And um, I did this show and it was the first time I ever did a show where I was, I was trying to tell a story. Like mm-hmm. I had this 45 minute show and I was talking about social media addiction and, and, and like how easy it is to control people using technology and using magic to address themes that I was seeing like, uh, uh, becoming more apparent in, in everyday life. And these people just didn't get it. And I don't know if it was just them, but I did that show a few more times and realized that magic was never gonna give me a platform to, to talk about I'm not, just, I'm not just someone who gets up a stage and perform. Like, you, you know, I'm yeah. like, I'm a, I'm, a very, I'm a very, like, opinionated person. It's never going to allow me to just speak my, speak my... So then in, in January, like, right about January, I'm like, right, I'm going to put on this art show, mm-hmm. which I did with you. Um, I started program. I was like, right, I can't... I'd always been, always done art. Like, when I was, like, 15, I wanted to go to art school and do animation. Yeah. Like, I used to do these claymore things. But I wasn't very good at drawing. Okay, I can, I, I can, I can draw, yes, but it's not what I'm like. I'm gonna sit down and draw. Like I'm not something I just. But I love coding. 
Yeah. I love coding. And when I, when I code, I think of things, you know, because in my mind, when you program something, I can create a little business. I'm gonna explain this in your, in your, in your, in your, like, in yeah. your terms for your yeah. like, listeners, right? Like I can create a business <clears throat> and I can create like 500 people and I can give them all jobs and they can all, and it's, I'm building the business how I want it to be. It doesn't have to be like in a building, an office. It could be in a mm -hmm. world where they're all like connected by a fucking wire or wirelessly. Like it can be just crazy. And then that business can have a function. But then like a program could be a hundred businesses <laughs> all wired together. Before you know it, you've got like this economy that you've built. An empire, yeah. An empire. And I'm, I'm writing the code for it. You know? So uh, I started being like, right, I think there's like a lot of art behind that. And, and yeah, then we, then we, then we, I don't know where to say now, like, then we did the show, right? Like, yeah. Which was mad. Like, so, yeah, like, um, it was absolutely crazy. So you went from being a magician, you said that you started to lose a little bit of love for it. Mm. So you lost the fulfillment out of it basically. And during that time you were doing talks and then you sort of. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't done any talks at that point, I think. Never. Never, no. Apart I mean, from being on stage. Been on stage, like been on stage a lot. I mean, but never done any keynote speaking. Okay. But I watched a lot of keynotes and a you know, big fan of watching TED Talks. Yeah. Really big fan of TED Talks. And you've done, you, I know you're a big fan of them, right? You've done two. Well, one of my personal goals, as you well know, is to yeah. do a TED Talk in my life. Yeah, which you're going to do. It's uh, going to happen. Definitely. I've got to do it. <laughs> I have to do it. Um, yeah, I, I, that, was on my, that was on my goals board. So you, your vision board, yeah? So you, Yeah, I used to have one. I used to have like six of them, actually. Okay. I'd, I'd write like artistic. Then I'd have like little goals. Like one of them was to be in Wired magazine, and then I got that. It's funny because whenever I do it, I always double it. I don't know why. Like I was like, I want to be in Wired, and then I was in Wired two months in a row. Oh. And then with the TED Talk thing, I was like, I want a TED Talk and TED Talk two months in a row. And I'm like, well, this is, so, why does it take so? Hard? It's so long to get there. And then when you get there, it's like easy. It's a compound effect. It is. Yeah. 100%. As soon as it hits, yeah, yeah. Then, it then it's like then it's easier in your mind to do. So right? where were the two TED Talks, and what were they on? So the first one was in Berlin, and that was a it was called Moonshot and that was, I basically revealed all of my America's Got Talent tricks. Okay. Which was like... So you broke the code of conduct? Yeah, dude, they emailed me. I bet, what, the Magic, Magic Circle? Circle? They um, emailed me, right? I'm surprised you're not what been worked out by the Illuminati. I know, I know, right? They, they, they emailed me and it was really funny because they were like, I think they know if they kick me out, it's gonna be all over my Wikipedia page. Like, yeah. I'm gonna be, because I'm a writer now for Hacker Noon, which is this like, big magazine for technology. It's like the biggest technology magazine at the moment. And uh, you should invest in them. Okay. No, no, seriously, you can invest in them now. They're going public. Okay. Um, they're gonna be huge. They're gonna be huge. Anyway. So uh, yeah, I said to them like, you know, if you, if you kick me out of the magic circle, I'm gonna just write a part, like story about it and make it go like, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I win either way because it's funny if I get kicked out. But yeah, I mean, some of the YouTube comments are really salty. Like magicians getting really angry, saying things like. There was a guy in America many years ago when I was a kid and he was a masked magician <laughs> and he got found out yeah. who he was and I think he got massively sued. Oh yeah, probably so, did. So like, it is obviously a bit of a risk either way, but... Well, I'm smart about it. Like, I don't reveal anyone else's tricks. Okay. I only reveal things that I made. Okay. And if a magician wants to say... But they can't say shit then, can they? Well, it's the thing is like, people are like, oh, this is, you know, you've revealed like things that people do and I'm like, no, I haven't. I'm stood in front of like the world's smartest people. They're not dumb. They don't believe in magic. Yeah. But if I say, here's a thing I built that's a robot, they're like, that's cool and that's inspiring for them. They don't care about magic or that. You know, these aren't, the TED Talks aren't getting watched by, you know, the people that are going to be like, oh, magic, do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. I think it's a bit silly. Like people are just doing a bit, a bit silly. But, but yeah, I, I thought it was actually quite, if anything, I was like, I want it to be inspiring for magicians. And it's nice that I got, I got quite a few people coming and be like, whoa. Like I went and for, for the love of magic, I went and taught myself to make electronics, like program <coughs> microchips. Like, do you remember if I said that to you? Like, hey, how do you program microchips? You'd be like, that sounds hard. That sounds very complex. And it's not, it's not. I think in a, like literally an hour, I could get you programming a microchip to, to do anything you want. Like turn all the lights on this building. Really? Like, mate, in an hour, I guarantee, you'd be shocked at how easy it is. We'll do that next time. Yeah, but this, this was the point of the thing. <laughs> it was like, I wanted people to realize that it's not as scary or as hard as it, really, as it might look. You know, like, and that's the, been the whole purpose of of, the, of that talk. Was like, I'm going to reveal how I, in you know, in my records got talent stuff, I had these ideas. And I was like, right, let's just go and make it, and we'll learn how to do it along the way. So, so that was the one in Berlin. Yeah. And Next then, one was Romania. Romania, which was a couple weeks back, and then I just talked about my art and okay. what I was trying to do with my art. Cool. Which, 
Yeah. You know about. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done an event here, which yeah. we've got some uh, pieces up at the moment. Yeah. Which um, I need to, need to like we, refine we need, a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. I've like switched them. I'm so picky with stuff, aren't I? So the event was like called Strangers, the title. It we was. had some bunch of cool people down there. We here. did, didn't we? It was really, I, I must say, all the whole team really chipped in there. Yeah. And, and we actually had a lot of really cool people come through. We had some amazing people. And we then did. we ended up getting into a the Even Standard, I think yeah. it was amazing, yeah, it was and cool. a bunch of other publications. Yeah, ID covered advice. Um, I think it was, cool. it was great. Yeah, it was. Reggie Hates roll through. It was funny because <laughs> like Mikey was saying, wasn't he? He's like, really want Reggie to come through. And, and Professor Green. Yeah, pro. Yeah, Stephen came through. That's yeah, nice. He's man. great. Like, yeah, it was really cool. He actually helped me with a couple of the pieces. Like, we met really briefly, and it was one of those weird things. Just started texting casually, and I was like, I'm making these pieces, and they resonated with him because he does loads of really great work for yeah. mental health. Like he's incredible when it comes to the way he speaks about that stuff. I was going to speak speak about this because yeah. so being in art for I think nearly five years or so now, yeah. um, as you well know, our main bread and butter, so to speak, is it's Hamilton. Richard Hamilton, which yeah. is behind us, he, and yeah. the reason why I feel that a lot of people get to like him. Invest into his stuff. Relate to him, 100%. It's because of like some of the controversial things he went through. Yeah. And many would say that's why people like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring and him yeah. are fantastic um, painters because they've got so much feeling because of so much trauma. Yeah. So with some of your artwork, mm. would you say that's also true or is it yeah. just off the cuff kind of stuff? No, no, no. Okay. It's all come. It's funny because when I did the TED talk, I was like getting quite emotional on stage and I found myself struggling to talk about it because okay. it came from this place like I'm very different now to how I was six months ago. Right? Yeah, of course. Like six months ago, I was not in a good place. Like I was really struggling with, with depression. Like my ADHD was really bad, and yeah, I tried everything. I've gone on like I've gone on retreats. Like I've meditated every day. I've done yoga. I've read every book. Like I've tried it all. Right? I, I really, really gave it so much thought and effort, and I put off things like you know, I did therapy for a very long time. Like I put off the the medication side of it, and then when I when I subscribed to the medita med medication, there were like lots of, I mean, there was one time I was really depressed and I was, I was really in a bad place. And this is the thing, this is what I have to, like, oh, it's so funny. You know, because people don't get it. They're like, how can you be depressed? Like, oh, you're successful. Or you have these great things, blah, 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 whatever. I'm like, okay, well, let me pose it this way. Okay, imagine being um, successful enough not to have to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to work every day. Or it, your work is in fact, maybe like in your instance, Sometimes, I'm not putting down what you do, but sometimes you might just have to make a phone call and you can make business. And that could, that could be enough to pay your bills. Yeah, Could be just a phone call a week. Of course. You know, in my case, sometimes like 15 minutes. That could be my week. That's what I need to do. That's what you've got. And then you're doing something that you don't love, but it makes you great money. Yeah. And everyone loves you for it. It's a mad paradox. everyone identifies you for it. So everywhere I go, I'm Tom the Magician, Tom the Magician, Tom the Magician. But I don't love being a magician. I'm actually got no interest in inventing magic tricks. I'm, I'm interested in technology. And when I talk about that, I get kicked out of the magic circle. So similar to Shabazz, who I interviewed only a few days ago. Right. Um, he uh, was attempting a world record. Yeah. And he openly said in our interview, he doesn't like cricket. <laughs> but he was so obsessed with trying to break something yeah. that you know he just had to go into it. And he also said that everyone identified him in business as, as oh, you're the, you're the cricketer. Yeah. And he didn't want to be that like, person. So yeah, I wanted yeah, no, to no, share no. that. Yeah, no, no, that's the thing. And, and, and then like, as well as that, there's, there's loads of things that I, from my past from when I was young, because trauma is a fascinating thing. You, you could be in a kid and something silly happened that was, you know, your parents left you at a shopping mall and that can create trauma, but th that can then also cause a problem in later life, right? Of course. So anyway, I'm not saying I got left alone in a shopping mall, but like you can have all these things you don't address throughout your life. So I got to point like hit hit 25, and it's okay. I'm like financially sort of stable, like I'm fairly successful. I've achieved the things I've wanted to achieve in life. What's more, like more money, more like more stuff? No, like that's not the enlightenment that I'm looking for now. Now it's now it's the enlightenment of self. Like what it is that I really want to make. What do I really want to do? Like what do I want to what is coming out of my like, inside, right? But that's not motivated by money or fame or any of those things. Which, when you're young, <coughs> very easy to get lost in, right? Mm -hmm. Very easy to get lost in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, 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 all of that artwork was about kind of my, it came from a place of my struggle with dealing, like dealing with depression and being open about it and dealing with the ADHD and being open about it. Yeah. Because there are two things that people like, you know, like people with depression, like I see all the time people are like, oh, I'm a bit depressed today because X, Y, Z. It's like, it's not something because. It's like, 
waking up and not being able to get, being able to get out of bed. Yeah. And they describe it as like color lo losing its vibrance, food losing its taste. You know, all, all of the things you use to measure any enjoyable experience become gray. Yeah. Everything is a constant state of middle. Yeah. There's no happiness, euphoria, there's no... And I was a bit manic. I'd go through moments of euphoria, like set up a business in five days and then five days later, shut the whole thing down and be depressed. Like really stupid stuff. I had this coffee company I set up, like set the whole thing up in a week. I was importing this incredible coffee, like the best coffee in the world from, from Jamaica. Like all the packaging, all the website, the design, people are buying it. And then a week later, I'm like, shut the whole thing down. Like, no, 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 I'm, I can't do it. One extreme to the other. Uh, yeah, manic, absolutely manic. Trying to find my way because mm -hmm. I was stuck in this magic thing that I didn't enjoy. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I'm sat in this coffee shop and the owner comes up to me and like, oh, you program and stuff. Can you make, maybe make something for the wall? They've got a projector. And they used to project a fireplace on it. It's really cool. It's all right. I had this weird idea in my head. I was like, I want to build this like clock with dots and dots that, like get generated based on the time, but it's always procedurally different. And anyway, I sat there for half an hour, made it the next morning. It's, like, it's still there now, it's up. And that was it. That was when I was realized like, oh my God, I can program art. I can yeah. communicate things that I feel, like, you know, like being present. That, one, that piece is about being present, right? Yeah. It's about trying to bring people into a unique present, present state. I can program art. And then I started being like, right, there's so many people on the internet who are depressed. What if I find them and put them in front of people artistically? Yeah. And that's where Strangers came from. Right? The, um, I love, like some, some, some of them I really, really love. You like and the food bank one. Like, yeah, I love, so I love the two that always stick out for me is the one that someone's tweeting yeah. about depression. Yeah. Anything to do with depression. And yeah. we're looking at it real time. Yeah. And we can see someone suffering and it's they're putting out a message to the world. But the other one, which was most compelling because I think it's one of the biggest problems in the world and yeah. such a mad paradox between the people that have to the people that haven't, yeah. was a essentially like a mirror TV. Yeah. And there was one number flashing up in red yeah. and that was all the money spent in America yeah. on weight loss products or programs. Yeah. So people trying to lose weight and it was Billions, if not more, yeah, trillions or whatever, whatever. It was billions. It was a hundred. It was hundred seventy-seven million. I can't remember. It was a day. It's just a, a day. Lot. And then so it's on the flip of that, there was another number come up, and I went, "Tom, what's this?" Mm. And it was basically the amount of lives which have been lost down to starvation. Yeah. People dying yeah. because they couldn't afford food. Yeah. Or healthy food or whatever. And what's fascinating, it's got nothing. It's got everything to do with um, infrastructure, right? That's the reason why. You know, you've got like a few locations in the world where people haven't got access to food. It's not like, oh, spread across, but it's, it's it, that's, what's fascinating is that like there's so many layers in that. You can, you can look at it and be like, well, where is it in the world that people are starving? And then mm. go, well, America is clearly the, like the fattest one of them all, right? But then also, if you think of it in a global, because I like to think of a your united global you know, ideology. Like yep. everyone in the world is united and we're all, because at the moment we, we all live in different countries and we're all fighting each other, right? We're not a united planet. Yeah. We all use the planet's air in a shared, you know what I mean? We all use the, like everyone's contributing to the planet, but we're all kind of fighting each other about how it's, we're not worked that bit out yet. Yeah. We're not there yet. But what I think is fascinating in that piece is that it kind of, it, it leaves it open to you to be like, well, why don't you think about where all these people are starving? Yeah. And then why don't you think, and it's, it's very obvious where the money's being spent, right? Of course. <laughs> like, and look how much money there is. Of course. But it's fascinating how easy it is to solve, because what I did in that piece was it actually, it's subtracting from that number the amount of money needed to solve the starvation problem. Yeah. So it's like there's so much excess. Yeah. So much excess. Yeah. If some strange reason we're so consumed with military defense budgets, yep. like things like that. Yeah. You know, still, and it's like you think about the general some of the problems we have in the world. Yeah. How easily would they be solved if people weren't fighting each other to, to survive? Absolutely. You know, if, if instead of fighting, I mean, there was people still fight over religion and culture a lot. Yeah, but you know, if everyone was able to eat, everyone had clean access, like drinking tap, um, had access to clean <coughs> drinking water, would that have a positive or negative effect on violence or do you know what I mean? People struggling or pressure. Yeah, I mean, like if you couldn't eat tomorrow, I think I'm actually like your mental state. Cool. Now you're going to be a little bit. You'll be in. You'll be right up. Mode. Yeah, you'll yeah. be like I'm like this is live or die situation, right? Of course. So yeah, there's, I think that's what's fun about that piece. For you, it's very much like, you, I know you've told me many times about not wasting food. Yeah. Like, yeah that's oh, how it communicates to you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and one of the, 
reasons I wanted you on the podcast is specifically to talk about your art because going back to Hamilton, mm. I'm going to be honest with you, yeah. right? When I first heard, well, even just saw Hamilton piece, I was like, yeah, it's cool, but let's be real, it's purple with a black uh, shadow man on it. Mm. And it was only until I heard one of the major guys who used to trade and promote his work told me the full story. Yeah. Then my interest and my taste was like, oh, I really understand this now. And that's why people spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, mm. and probably soon millions into his artwork. Mm. And with you, I wanted people to get to know you and mm. also to get, get to know the meaning behind your art yeah. and the reason why it's got such great value to it, basically. Mm. So is there anyone that you feel has inspired you as an artist? Damien Hirst obviously came up once in your yeah, conversation. I, yeah, I like Damien Hirst because it was very like brutalist, wasn't it? It's like very, it's all about death. And it was very, it was, you know, his, his, his original works were, were very like, very conceptual as well. I liked that. You know, you could sit in front of it and it's great because I love it when he explains his work because it's, he's always like, you're like, what? You just, you're like, that's genius. But also like, I would have never have known that. And I, I like that about my art. I want my art to be something that you have on the wall and you look at it and you're like, yeah, that's that's what I love most. When I'm yeah. like, oh, that's the Matrix rain scene, and people are like, cool. Yeah. And I'm like, no, but every one of those is a tweet in real time. Someone tweeting about depression, in real time. Like they've just hit the tweet button, and then people go, what? I'm like, yeah, there's an AI that's getting all the tweets off of Twitter, and I'm using sentiment sentiment analysis from IBM to work out if it's someone like a human or a random thing or not, and if it's sad. And then I'm removing the profile pictures, the tags, the hashtags, all of that and just having a pure emotion and raining it down. That's when I'm like, I think that's a beautiful thing for people to be able to sit and talk and communicate. Yeah. Because we don't have that anymore. You know, we sit down around dinner and we don't have storytelling situations anymore because, you know, you used to sit down and you talk about film. Like we'd be like, hey, did you see uh, Star Wars episode? Creed. You see Creed? <laughs> yeah. You see, yeah, you see, no, you see Rocky IV, like Rocky yeah. III. Like, did you see that? <clears throat> oh yeah, remember that scene, da, da, da. But now we're like, do you watch Stranger Things? Yeah. What season are you on? Nine. Yeah. Like what of the what of the hundred episodes are we going to talk about now? You, yeah, you, things have changed a little bit. Like music, like it's on steroids. It's Stop. on steroids. Pump, it's pumped, pumped up. up like crazy. Everything's just like so much information. So a lot of my my art is taking all that data, stripping it down, making it really bite size. Then also not being really blasé in how I explain the work, letting it letting people stand around it and go like, what is that? Yeah. And then if someone knows, oh that's this. I'm, Wait what? Yeah. And then trying to give that because. There's no, there aren't really any artists at the moment, and I've been looking for them, and every day I come across one person every now and then who's kind of like in that world. But I am struggling to find anyone that's trying to communicate, reflect contemporary life in real time. And that's what my work's about. It's about how can I, how can I paint these pictures that tell a story about the world that is today, yeah. but will change as time goes on. It's yeah. so like one of my favorite pieces is the blockchain one. I love it. Yeah. I fucking love it. I called it coins for speculation, like playing on such the a, such cause. Such a cool word. Yeah, like cause phrase. for speculation, yeah. coins. And like the Bitcoin thing was a bubble. Uh, you know, I had so many friends invest in it. Some made loads of money, some lost all their money. And I called it because like the technology is as it is. It's like, you know, it's not, it's not a thing. It's just, it's just a load of rubbish. Uh, it's not a lot of rubbish. It's great in many ways, but like it's yeah. like it's like a monetizing blockchain was like monetize, monetizing email. That's kind of how it felt, of course. right? Um, so I made this piece where it goes back in time seven years, and it buys a hundred dollars of bitcoins theoretically, and then it gets the real time price of it right now. And that's what's cool because bitcoins traded for twenty four seven, so I can go back seven years down to the second and get the price. Okay. And you think about that, imagine going through a fight, like if I explain it like this, right? I built a company and there's this guy, right? Steve, he's in this filing cabinet, right? And he'll go, he's really good at it. Every, every second he'll go through the file, he'll find the price of Bitcoin at that exact second. He'll then go back in time, seven years, buy a hundred dollars worth of those coins. It's a clever move, inside trading. Yeah, yeah, it is, right? <laughs> then he'll go back into the future, seven years, and he'll sell them out. He'll actually, he'll call up another guy, Tim, Tim's got the real time price of Bitcoin. Like, Tim, hey, yo, I've got 67 Bitcoins on me right now. What's that worth? He'll go, $198,000. I'm like, cool. And then he'll just write it. Like, he'll typewrite it on this yeah. green screen on this mirror. So I just, I loved it because you look at it and it's like, you're either going to go, most people are going to go, fucking hell, why didn't I buy a Bitcoin? Like, yeah. just $100 <laughs> worth. And a lot of people will go, oh, what a bubble, because they'll see. Like, when the exhibition happened, it was 280K. Now it's 160. 
Yeah. And I'm sure in a few years now it'll be a hundred and da, yeah. da, da, before you know it, it'll be nothing. <laughs> so it's like the piece is changing as time goes on. And I like it that someone can tell that story through the piece. And you look at it and you're like, I don't get it. It's only, it's only worth a dollar. And you're like, yeah, but 20 years ago, yeah. that was 198 grand. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, what? And you're like, yeah, well, there was this massive thing called the Bitcoin bubble. <laughs> and that's how dad made all his money, yeah. son. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I have that, that story in my mind. So my work is definitely about trying to tell stories, but tell stories in a way where it's like, I don't just have to create a static piece of art. I can create something that changes with it's, time. It's ongoing. And yeah. I was going gonna to talk to, um, it's a little bit of a uh, kind of like a shocking stroke dark mm. um, Bit, bit of art or an installation that you've done, which is just behind us. Unfortunately, it's not on today. Oh, yeah. but, so we've got uh, the Xanax one in the middle. Easy mode. And cool. then we've got two lightsabers beside it. One yeah. represents Yeah, men, strike me down. And one of them female. And this is my take on it. Yeah. And the reason why it's set up like that is my, my view on it. Yeah. So the center, which is the Fallen Rain or Xanax, yeah. for anyone who doesn't know, Xanax is meant to be an antidepressant. It's gonna yeah. calm Anti -anxiety, you down. Anti-anxiety, yeah. 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 It's meant to anxiety. make you mellow. And over in yeah. America, not so much here, no. it's prescribed, and even, this is the sickening thing, yeah. ab advertised legitimately mm. on TV, on yeah, commercials, yeah. as they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you can buy it, and people get hooked on this stuff. So it's short every term, rap song, isn't it? Every rap song, everyone's yeah. like, you know, some rappers are called cool, like you got Lil Xan. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and they they rap about positive and negative. It's effects. almost cool for them to be affiliated with it or take it. Yeah. But the irony is, short term, yeah, it does the trick. It's meant to make you mellow, mellow out and yeah, knock also, you out for twelve hours. Like, but if you keep on taking it, it turns you into highly like strung, maybe anxiety yeah. and also depressed. So. Every time they're falling, this is more and more people ordering mm. Xanax from the company. Being and prescribed, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the both sides of it, you've got one lightsaber representing men, one lightsaber representing female. And every time they flicker, this is the mad thing, right? If I saw someone committing suicide mm. or some kind of death, mm. I will be obligated by law mm. to report it. If I don't, I could be liable. I didn't know that. Well, it's an obligation, isn't it? If someone killed themselves in front of me, yeah. I've got to then say, I've got to report it. I didn't know it was a legal thing, though, to report it. That's yeah, crazy. because okay. someone's, someone's died, isn't yeah, they? Yeah. they? They're committing suicide, and that's I mean, fact is a crime. You would, yeah. but I mean, like, the, that's crazy. So anyway, you said to me that when they flicker, Steve, mm. Mm. that represents someone committing suicide yeah. I went what yeah, yeah. Like committing suicide mm. so when I saw it flicker it was almost like I was a part of it yeah it was almost like I had witnessed someone dying wow and I was like fuck I'm, being, I'm sort of being dragged into like yeah like this art and also the, the message behind it and that yeah. is the mad thing because mm. unlike a painting and stuff it's just there and you can it's work out isn't it a painting like is this is this is this is this is ever evolving this yeah. is throwing all this data at you yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're like jesus well, it's a lot to take in like i you know I, when i made those two pieces i made them because that was my struggle god man you know what's, i'm so far from the place i was when i made this stuff yeah and it's so funny now because when we talk about it i realize why i made it all but this is good because it, a message to everyone is if you're going through some stress, anxiety, depression, yeah. in actual fact, as long as you get out of it, it's okay, because okay. you'll be able to develop yeah, some really, really good stuff. Yeah, of course, and, and I think doing the, the exhibition actually was a really great way for me to let it all out, Yeah, because hiding it is very hard. But yeah, that piece I made, it strike me down, was because there was a scene I used to watch in Star Wars where um, Obi-Wan Kenobi would say to Darth Vader, like, strike me down, Darth, and I'll become more powerful than you can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And I used to think like I was so limited by the constant desire of just wanting to not exist. And the idea, the idea of being able just to die was making, becoming more powerful. It was yeah. like, I will be free. Yeah. I'll be free from the constant struggle, the constant like the pain every day you feel. So in my mind, I was like, right, well, I wanna have these two lightsabers. So I, I bought these lightsabers from this place and I had to build them. Uh, oh man, I built them two days before the show. You remember I was like, yeah, wiring them, told myself to wire them, like very I, resourceful. Yeah, we were running around London picking stuff. We were, up. weren't we? Do you remember? Yeah. You guys are great. It was so good. I think on one person, I was even like, yeah, I was like, I need black tape. I need this glue. I need this, that, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all came. It was great. Um, but yeah, no, I remember wiring them up, and, and and then I put the Arduinos in the back of them, and they would they're connected to the internet, so they would basically get data off my server. But then I get, I've got a company that gets the data from, so basically the UK. Um, I can't remember who it is that I used. I think it was Mind I used, or Calm. I think it was Calm. 
but they obviously cl they collect the statistics, right? The mm -hmm. charity for you know, mental health in the UK. And what I thought was fascinating is how more men commit suicide than women. Now, I watched a really interesting talk on this the other day about uh, feminism. And there was this guy who was arguing with this feminist. It was fascinating to see. And she's like, men make more money uh, for, for, you know, all the richest men, the richest people in the world are all men. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. The top 0.0001% of everyone are men. The richest people in the world aren't men in general. And then he's like, men are more depressed. Men kill themselves more. Uh, men have more like anxiety. All of these like mental health issues. And it's massively male dominated. Mm. Insanely so. Yet it's not talked about. Yeah. Now men don't go and say like, oh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm suicidal. I'm depressed, I'm da 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 da. You know? So what I thought was fascinating about that was that. So what I did is I, I programmed them to do the real time, real time rates. So I did a bit of math like, to make it feel, to do it. It's kind of sickening when I think about it, but I wanted, to, I just wanted to, to express that part of my life or the, t the moment I went through where that was something where I was really balancing with. Yeah. And, and, how, and how, how, si how hard it is also for men to open up about it, but also, I wanted just to be like, right, I'm just gonna open up about it. I'm yeah. just gonna let it out and go. Cause it's a scary thing to talk about. Like yeah. I did it and I had, I had like, um, you know, things I was working on, collaborations I was working on, um, you know, clients that just dropped me. They just can't be affiliated. Of course. And um, you know, that's, that's, that sucks. But you know, you are, it's understandable. It's understandable. But that said, it's not, it's also just, you know, it's a part about what's being human. So yeah, I, I, I was like, right, I'm gonna do that. And then I, I, I it's, it's you know it's one of those things you just sit there and you kind of you kind of see it. I don't think anyone's ever. It's not something I'd ever say. Someone might want to have it on their wall, right? Mm. It's you know for me it's like it's something that was a, a part of my life that I made. It was an expression of a way I felt, and, and you know, I'm very glad that I made it. Yeah, like all my art, and uh, I think it's and but easy mode was different. Easy mode was like that's something I will forever, forever love because yeah. th that was about the desire to want to like. You know, I get it all the time some days, man. Like, I wake up, I'm like, God, I just wish I could just take one of those, like, take some, like, Lexapro or something, like, you know, antidepressant, just get get away. Yeah. And and it's funny, because that was the point of it. I'm gonna create this, like, rain, and the, the pills that they hit the, this when they hit the middle where your head is, they bounce off your head, mm. they don't touch you. It's just like, as much as you wanna dive in there and consume and escape. But the piece was about in life, you know, you've done this, I've done this, we play the, we play that, we play on hard mode. We mm. play on expert mode, we play mm -hmm. on God mode. Yeah. You know, we're trying to be the best or we're trying to be the best that we can be. Yeah. Or we're trying to reach heights that people haven't reached and there, there isn't a path in front of you, you're kind of having to learn and fail and learn and fail. Yeah. And, and it's a hard, being self-employed as well, it's hard, it's not easy. Very tough. It's very tough. There's very no tough. paycheck coming at the end of the week. And like You could never really, like, I know schools are there and universities are there and there's these learn. courses, but there's, n there's nothing like actual real experience of learning on the job. 100%. I know there's, we've only got a short amount of time because I know you've yeah. got to get somewhere, but there's three oh, yeah, more questions right. I want to ask you. Yeah. So, from that moment, can I speak about a fucking amazing thing that you've just done recently? Yeah, for real. You went over to Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You made a bit of art yeah. for what brand? Valentino. Mate, that is yeah, sensational. Man. Yeah, it's crazy. Because I remember, like, even a couple of weeks before, you were, you've always been you, but you were on the knife edge of, like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then suddenly you got a breakthrough yeah, yeah. for a massive fashion brand yeah, yeah, reached out to you. I know. It's crazy. And they wanted you to do uh, some artwork for them over in Tokyo, which yeah. is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just a small little insight yeah, yeah. on that. Yeah, um, I got a phone call and they're like, we, we like what you're doing. Um, and they asked me to recreate the, the fashion, <coughs> the house codes of the fashion brand. Um, so I created this hologram. And then they're like, hey, can you do our, our billboard videos? So I then got to design in Shibuya Square the billboard ads. Incredible. And I like, you know, I did this whole hacking thing, like had my name up on there. And I remember being in Shibuya Square and it was all going off. And then they're like, oh, can you do a video installation as well? So I, then I went in the store and I made this video installation. That's wall. sick. It was amazing, man. It was really cool. Like that was, that was really, really cool. Met some really cool people and it was great. But it, you know, it's one of those things I was like, I loved it. I think that was really great, but there's still so much work to do. And like my, on oh, my goal, number one is, you know, I want to, I, there's some museums I want to get into. Like yeah. there's some museums that I want to have my work in and that's the goal now. And I'm working at that, but 
that was yeah it was a real godsend um to get that so so early on but that's the thing sometimes things just knock on your door yeah uh, yeah they like, do. Li- literally i've been i've been personally not not to, towards uh art same as you but like in other parts of my life where I, i'm thinking you know what things are not feeling so great at the moment they're going actually completely wrong and yeah. then the next week something happens yeah. and your life turns completely yeah. around and to be honest most people looking in and thinking everything seems to be the same but mm. really internally in my mental state i'm like hang on a minute things are not going so right but then the next week things are going fantastic yeah it's crazy so that's the first thing the second thing is where are you going to see yourself in five or ten years and whether that's personally or with your art because when i'm speaking to harris newcomb recently yeah. or i speak to any artist yeah. there's always this question that comes up about art being investment yeah and if you do agree with it, how would you like to see your, your market unfold? Because yeah. some artists are saying to me, they would love to wake up one day, Sotheby's or Christie's put their piece into auction. Let's just yeah. say there's a reserve. Yeah. And then suddenly they wake up and they see their piece of art being bought by the general public or in collectors yeah. or investors, and it's gone for like five times over the reserve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you feel? And there's that kind of like the vision I that mean, you've got. This is the thing, this is like what goes back down to when I did my first magic thing. Like I, re- I reinverse, reinvest everything. And for me, I want to make things that are just mind blowing. Like I'm, I'm working on something now. I've got a mirror where it can track your eyes. You stand in front of it, and it can. It's got an infrared camera that's tracking where your eyes are looking on the screen. So when you look, I'm, I'm not kidding. When you look at the certain point on that mirror, it moves a pop up ad, a U porn pop up ad, to that location. We're sort of that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is like, I wanted, to, I wanted to be like, isn't it funny how we're all constantly being shown adverts? Yeah. So now you get up in the morning, you stand in front of your mirror to get ready, and it's like, you can't even avoid the, the fucking pop-up. Yeah. It's following your fucking eyes. Like, yep. so I mean, I'm, and that was expensive to make. So yeah, my, my, in terms of like my art, man, I'd love it if people bought my art and wanted to, because it evolves, doesn't it? And I'm, I'm, I only make one of ones, right? Like I only make one piece and that's it. So I love the idea of people being like, oh, I've got the this piece. This particular I, Yeah, one. I've got this one and it's there and people will talk, uh, come around, come see it because yeah. it's a bit crazy and how especially it if it's been featured in like hotels or certain yeah. magazines or well, publications, you, it's, it's so, it's, you know. It's been really fascinating, like getting people recently hit me up and saying like, oh, I've made this, your work inspired me or yeah. what you're doing's inspired this X, Y, Z or people asking me now to do things where I direct like more co- corporate or commercial or other things. I'm like, wow, this is really, really, really cool. But so, so your 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 vision, Lolo, uh, your vision for you yeah. is still within art. Yeah. Well, I mean, my yeah, my big my big ten, goal is ten years from now. Where would you like to see yourself? Where oh, is Tom Webb in, in ten, 10 years? years? I want to have some stuff like you know, like I le- I literally want yeah, like public play stuff that's just mind blowing. Like I want to have stuff that's you know you're walking down the street and there'll be something there that's just just out of this world going on and everyone's like what is this crazy expression of or you go to a gallery and it's like I'm doing a solo show um, like the State Lake Museum in Amsterdam I can never pronounce it but I really want to do a solo show there and just and just blow people's minds like completely blow people's minds and even not even that but like in a, in any expression of art bringing the technology into it like. But yeah, I think, I mean, it's been what? It's been a year and some crazy stuff's happening already. Mm. Like next year we'll be doing, I'm sure we'll be doing Basel, we'll be doing loads of stuff. Like in five years, I definitely want to be in, in uh, a lot of different museums all over the world. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. I want people to be able to see this stuff. I want people yeah. to be able to see what, what I'm trying to show them. Like this is what the world is like today. Talk yeah. about tech. Do, like this. do you think you ever evolve out of like the tech art stuff or would it remain within in I mean, that in that sort yeah, of Yeah, I mean when I did the Bavantia thing I had to I had to draw. I had to teach yeah. myself how to do pixel pixel animations and animated them all by hand. Okay. Um I think yeah, a hundred that I've started doing sculptures. Yeah. I'm working on I've got a three D printer, I'm working on like m- making models. I wanna do um I'm actually interviewing Scooney soon. Are you? Well yeah. this is what's funny, I'm gonna do some styrofoam stuff and an aluminium like i've got a lot of inspiration from a lot of people but i basically now want to start taking things from artists that i like yeah and adding the real-time data the, the technology Sick. do you know what i mean and, and branching out i don't know if i'm ever oh, i have got this special canvas that i've been making i have a canvas that's paint and the paint uh is like it it it, it, it moves it's like a special technology i've been working on for right. about a year now ever since i started this is the first thing i actually made so the 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 painting is always moving 
but it's just ink. It's it's beauty. It's really cool. It's like and it uses data in it to make that's, it work. That's pretty it's intriguing, wild. man. So yeah, I think it's going to be fun. I think there's going to be local stuff coming. So when I leave my podcast, yep. my sort of catchphrase, my line is <laughs> "Be happy, yep. never content." Now I've been asked a few times, I why, love that. why why do you say that? Because when you say "be happy but never content," they're conflicting. Almost it appears. What I mean by "be happy" is is that. You can never be happy 100% of the time. Being sad and fearful actually serves you as well, like you, we mentioned 100%. about anxiety and depression and stuff. Especially but, for art. But most of the time, being happy is a state of mind. It's not in another country, it's not doing this and that. It is just, you either kind of condition yourself to be happy or not. But then the second part, which is never content, is like the pursuit of a journey or a goal. Now, we're in Bosa, who's, who's filming us today. Uh, their, their sort of slogan or catch line is the pursuit to perfection in the 21st century. You're never going to be perfect, but you can pursue it every single day. Yeah. So for me, where I'm happiest is when I'm pursuing goals. Yeah. I'm going around the houses explaining that. But if I were to say to you, be happy, never content, what does that actually mean to you? Uh, be happy in the fact that life is a constant. Life is Sifasus, the Greek titan, right? He's constantly, he's, he's constantly pushing this rock up a mountain only to get to the top and push it back down again, right? But we assume that this guy is, is happy doing so, even though he's banished for all eternity to do this. So it's like, when you say that to me, I'm like, well, you have to be happy knowing that life is never contentment. You're always pushing a boulder up, up a mountain, right? But that is happiness. Yeah. Happiness is the struggle. It is the journey. It yeah. is the hard work. That's, yeah. that's where you're at your best. The afterwards, like after Valentino, it's like, whatever. But making it for a month and being like, pulling my hair out, that was the best bit. Wicked. So um, where can we find your stuff? Where we can find you on yeah, social uh, media? And let's just say someone wanted to invest into your art. Yeah. Where would um, they, how would they go about doing that? Well, you, you, Obviously us. Getting in touch with you guys. Woodbury obviously House. Woodbury House. In Soho. Um, you've got my portfolio. You can check out my stuff on my website, which is literally web.site. <laughs> or my Instagram, cool. um, at web. Um, but yeah, there's loads of stuff on there. And yeah, just keeping your ear to the to the ground. Like, Woodbury House is the best place to find my stuff. Yeah, and we'll, <laughs> no doubt we'll be doing some more shows. Yeah, dude, this year, 100%. We've got got some, got 2009 is going to blow. It's going to be a mad one. Wicked. Thank dude. you for your time, bro. Thank you, nice man. One. Thanks Wicked. a lot.